people at home with our fellow parishioners, worshiping from the comfort of their home. The Lord said, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there will I be also. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to open our worship this morning with uh, a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Sue to come up and lead us in that. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us that we could come freely into this sanctuary and worship you. We don't have to be in fear of anybody coming in and stopping us, and we just thank you for those freedoms that have been bought for us. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. We just ask you to, to be with us as we worship you, Lord. Free us from everything that binds us, Lord, so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're wondering where the pastor is this morning, um, she got a call from Albright College. Uh, they, they moved up the date for uh, Liz's move-in. Get rid of that squeal, David. Um, because of COVID, that there is schedule change, so she had to take Liz up to school this morning as she starts her adventure. Uh, asked me last night if I would preach, and I said, those poor people. <laughs> Let's worship. We sing all morning. I'm 
promises I never could keep Take me to your living spring And wash me clean of everything And sanctifies deep Rise out to feed The great King David uttered these words in a prayer. And uh, I think this prayer should be sung by each one of us every single day of our life. Create in me a clean heart. This morning, the reading is from John 4, 19 through 26. 
Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. May God have his blessings on this reading. Let's pray. Father, open our spiritual eyes so that we may see the truth. May my words be your words this morning. In Christ's holy name, amen. The great C.S. Lewis said this, In the process of being worshipped, God communicates his presence to men. Dr. David Jeremiah said, If you don't worship, you'll never experience God. The great A.W. Tozer said, God wants worshipers before workers. Indeed, the only acceptable worth wor workers are those who have learned the lost art of worship. Pastor Jack Hayford said, Worship changes the worshiper into the image of the one worshipped. Our own John Wesley said, have an eye to God in every word you sing. The late Dr. Billy Graham said, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. The psalmist tells us to make a joyful noise to the Lord. What that means is that we are to intentionally raise our voices in praise to our King. We're to shout with joy in response to all that He is and for all that He's done. We're to acknowledge our dependence on Him. We're to testify to His greatness. We're to express our gratitude to God for His infinite goodness. I'd like to highlight this section of the psalm and call it Praise. Praise enables us to pay homage to our Creator, to publicly acknowledge Him as our King. Praise sets our eyes on the one to whom we owe everything. It's during this portion of praise and worship that we raise our voices in shouts of joy and acclamation. We lift the name of Jesus high. Praise not only gives proper respect to a holy God, but it also readies our hearts for the next phase. The psalmist tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter to his courts with praise. Praise has empowered us to enter into the presence of God so that we can worship him. Worship is adoration. It's giving thanks. Worship is praying without asking for anything. It's simply loving on God. 
It's more than formulas or methods or step-by-step -step instruction. Worship is heart-to-heart -heart communication between God and us. We'll, we'll highlight this section of the psalm and call it worship. Mark Hall, the uh, lead singer of the, the group Casting Crowns, explained worship like this. Quote, to me, God is saying, why you do what you do is almost more important than what you're doing. Because he wants to know your motivations behind what you do. Our motivation behind worship is important to God. It's important to what we're doing. And if my life doesn't glorify, how is singing somebody else's song off a screen bringing him glory? And one of Casting Crown's songs is called Life Song. The lyrics go, let my life song sing to you. You see, if we don't live our lives as a worship offering to God every minute of every day, then we're just going through the motions in a vain attempt to please God. God doesn't want our good deeds if the reason we do them is anything other than to honor Him. So our lives lived in submission to God and constantly honoring Him by our interactions with others is our life song. And our life song is our worship. Worship allows us to focus as a family on the action of praising and worshiping God in song. You may have noticed that I often have the band play an upbeat song first, followed by a more melodic and slower thoughtful song. This reflects a praise and worship model, one leading into the other, one creating an atmosphere that nurtures the other. Praise setting up the experience of worship. So it must be with our lives. We must praise the one who created us simply because he alone is worthy. This softens our heart and readies us for the experience of worshiping God, adoring him for who he is. True worship is defined by the priority we place on who God is in our lives. Let me say that again. True worship is defined by the priority we place on God and who he is in our lives and where God is on our list of priorities. True worship is a matter of the heart expressed through a lifestyle of holiness, a life devoted to God entirely. We worship God because he is God period. Our extravagant love and extreme submission to the Holy One flows out of the reality that, the, the reality that God loved us first. It's highly appropriate to thank God for all the things He's done for us. However, true worship is shallow if it's solely an acknowledgement of God's abundance. Our worship must be toward the one who is worthy simply because of his identity as the omnipotent, which means all-powerful, omniscient, which means all-knowing, and omnipresent one, which means he's everywhere simultaneously. And not just because, because God gives us an abundant life and meets our needs and answers our prayers, we got to focus our worship on the worthiness of God and not his abundance. In his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus painted the picture of what worship ought to be. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, 
when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. True worship must be in spirit, that is, engaging the whole heart. Unless there's a real passion for God, there's no worship in spirit. He knows posers when he sees them. We're all guilty at times. At the same time, worship must be in truth, that is, properly informed. Unless we know, really know, the God we worship, there's no worship in truth. Both are necessary for satisfying and God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth leads to a shallow, overly emotional experience that could be compared to a high. As soon as the emotion is over, when the fervor cools, so does the worship. Truth without spirit can result in a dry, passionless encounter that can easily f lead to a form of joyless legalism. The best combination of both aspects of worship results in a joyous appreciation of God informed by Scripture. The more we know about God, the more we appreciate Him the more we appreciate, the deeper our worship. The deeper our worship, the more God is glorified. The late Christian singer-songwriter Keith Green beautifully explains the heart as it should be when we worship in spirit and in truth. His song, Make My Life a Prayer to You, mirrors Jesus' explanation of worship. Listen to the lyrics. Make my life a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. No empty words and no white lies. No token prayers. No compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your son you sent to save us. From ourselves and our despair, it comforts me to know that you're really there. Well, I want to thank you now for being patient with me, though it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. I guess I'll have to trust and just believe what you say. You're coming again. You're coming to take me away. I want to die and let you give your life to me so I might live and share the hope you gave to me, the love that set me free. I want to tell the world out there you're not some fable or fairy tale that I've made up inside my head. You're God the Son. You've risen from the dead. So in closing, I suggest we need to consider a few things concerning worship. Maybe when the urge hits us to think, man, I didn't get anything out of church this morning, we should consider what Jesus said to the woman at the well. We need to worship in spirit and in truth. You see, a meaningful worship experience is born out of giving. Giving praise to God. Giving our love, our adoration, and submitting to His will. Living our lives for Him and our every action, our every thought being under His direction. Lofty goals. <laughs> And the only way we can do this is by knowing him intimately. And we do that through reading his word and talking to him directly. The more we know God, the deeper the worship. You can't help yourself. I don't read the scriptures as much as I should. I don't think any of us do. We probably don't pray as much as we should. And it's usually when we need something. Um... Praise and worship, spirit and truth, giving first of ourselves and blessing his name, then receiving blessing in return. 
It's more than just singing a few songs on Sunday morning. Although doing that's a wonderful reminder of God's presence and grace. The more we know about the Master, the more we want to praise Him and serve Him and worship Him. And it's my prayer that we truly learn to let our life song sing to Him. So let's make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Jesus said, Behold, I'm making all things new. <laughs> In obedience, therefore, we need to first of all repent of our sin. That means to turn away from doing things that are outside of God's will. We need to give our hearts to Him and stop playing church and start being the church. And then in faith, we need to live our lives in spirit and in truth as living examples of hearts that have been changed by His grace. Our lives will then truly become living worship. Living worship. Our lives will become a prayer. Every breath. That's such a beautiful thing. Lofty goal. Not easy. But that's what we should be striving for. Our lives will then truly, truly, truly become living worship as He indeed makes all things new. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Help us to live lives that truly are examples of living in spirit and in truth. Help us to make our lives prayers to you, Lord. As you make all things new. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Go now in peace. And in the knowledge that he is indeed making all things new, <laughs> as he promised. He always will. Let your life be a life song sung to him. And when you do that, other people notice and are drawn to him as well. God bless you. God protect your families. And God willing, we'll see you next week. Amen.
Somebody say amen.